what a 24 hours in this market. Get ready for Chairman Powell, day two. Live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning. Equity futures just about unchanged. The countdown to the open starts right now. Everything you need to get set for the start of U.S. trading. This is Bloomberg The Open with Jonathan Farrow. Live from New York coming up, a second take of Chair Powell on Capitol Hill as investors contemplate the return of jumbo rate hikes and the ADP report comes in hotter than expected. We begin with a big issue, opening the door to 50. There's clearly uh, uh, an upside risk to the March move. We saw those rate hike expectations start to move higher. 50 basis points is very much on the table. Chair Powell opened the door, but it's up to the data to decide. It will matter a lot to markets if it is 50 basis points. It's very important to listen to the second um, day of testimony. Thanks to Powell's testimony yesterday, uh, the fears are back fair and square in the market. We will see if Chair Powell wants to refine the message. The narrative can completely change if that jobs number on Friday is not in the same universe as it was the last go around. Does he want to reinforce the message? Does he want to walk back? It all is predicated on the data. Joining us now to discuss is JP Morgan, Oksana Aronoff, Crossmarks, Victoria Fernandez, to the both of you. Thanks for being with us. And let's start with you, Oksana. Just how low is that bar now for a 50 basis point move from the Fed chair? Good morning, Jonathan. Really interesting yesterday in the course of Powell's testimony, the odds of um, this hike moving from 25 to 50 basis points jumped from 35 percent to something like close to 70 percent or high 60s um, yesterday. So we'll see what today brings. But certainly a lot rides on the job numbers and the CPI number that's coming next week. And that's going to further tilt the scale towards 50 or, or back towards 25. I think 50 would be still, you know, kind of a shock to the market. But perhaps it is time for the Fed to, to shock these markets. The Fed has been, I think, you know, unnecessarily um, sort of transparent to the point where we're all caught up in parsing Fed speak incessantly. Uh, but be that as it may, I don't think at the end of the day, and this has been our view consistently for some time, the most, you know, I don't think that what matters is whether it's going to be an additional 25 basis points today. What ultimately matters is how long will the Fed, you know, keep rates elevated? And finally, the conversation is shifting to higher for longer, which has been our view and why we have not been in a rush to jump into these markets, which have proved to be, once again, the right decision this year. Well, Victoria, I think that's what a lot of people are finding unsettling. It would come down to pace, then it would come down to peak, and then duration at that peak. We thought we'd doubt with pace, it was 25. We thought we'd had a decent idea of where the peak would be, maybe five to five and a half percent. And then the debate was how long we'd stay there. And now, Victoria, we're talking about pace again. And I think a lot of people are confused about where this is all heading. Well, if you remember, Jonathan, before the last Fed meeting, you and I were talking and I said there was a risk. To me, the bigger risk was that we would have a 50 basis point move um, instead of having a more dovish move from the FOMC. And we didn't get the 50 basis point move then. So the question is now, I think that the market is finally catching up to where we at Crossmark were before that, wondering why we weren't seeing more action than what was actually there. If you recall at that time, yields were moving down, right? And we were saying something wasn't right. It didn't make sense how the market was reacting. Now we're seeing the market catch up. And I think the Fed is saying, look, we've been telling you this all along. Are you finally going to jump on the train with us and move along? And I think we are. Now, we need expectations to get to around 90 percent um, in the futures market for the 50 basis point usually to happen. We're not there yet, but we could be. But we've got plenty of data over the next two weeks before we get to that meeting. I also wonder if the Fed is watching, as I think they are, the longer term inflation expectations. Let's look at what happened to that longer end of the curve yesterday, Jonathan. It actually came down. The 30 year yield came down while everything else was soaring higher. I think that gives the Fed a little bit of room to make a higher move if they so decide because those are still well anchored. So I think they have the ability to do it. Whether they do or not, I think a lot of that depends on the data we get over the next two weeks. Well, to your point, 
I should say up front, this whole conversation is at the mercy of what we get on Friday morning in payrolls and next week in a CPI report. Just how low is that bar? City's Andrew Hollenhorst has this to say. He's going with 50 at the next meeting from this Federal Reserve. He says the 255,000 jobs and 0.5% month-on-month core CPI print we project in our final forecast are likely enough to provoke the 50 basis point high. But what if they don't go 50? What if the data comes in below that 255? Mohamed Alarian laying out the dilemma that Chair Pound now faces. Either validate the market move and in the process negate in an embarrassing fashion the forward policy guidance provided just a month ago, or stick with that guidance and fall further behind in the battle against inflation. Oksana, two hard decisions. Which one do you pick? I think if it were me, I think Chairman Powell should pick the more difficult decision, which is stay with the more hawkish policy, because the moment, as you said, they kind of embarrassingly um, duck tail and, and move or, or, or walk back their comments, you see markets ease financial conditions, which is exactly what they do not want. And so if they don't want that, then they should be really resolute and actually inject uh, a, a, you know, some amount of fear in this market, which continues to a large extent until really you know, perhaps the last couple of weeks, continues to largely disregard what Powell has been trying to communicate consistently, which is, hey, catch up with us. This is where we are. We're fighting inflation. We're resolute. And by the way, the economy continues to be resilient enough to allow us to do that. And the more you, you know, market participants ease financial conditions, the more resolute we're going to be because you're making our job that much more difficult. So I think uh, Powell should remain steadfast if he wants to see um, the results that he says he wants to see, uh, which is, you know, taming inflation. And if he wants to go down as, as the Volcker character in, in this um, chapter, which I think he does. The second day of testimony starts in 54 minutes. Mike McKee, I think a lot of people feel like one day was enough. Do we really need a second day of this? Yeah, uh, that's kind of the situation today. I'm not sure what else he could say unless he decided that the market reaction scared him. He wants to take it all back, which I very much doubt. Uh, the data we got this morning don't give us any reason to move one way or another at the moment with the ADP numbers coming in at 242,000. It's not a predictor for the payrolls report. The average miss has been 132,000 over the last six months. So I'm not sure it's going to have any effect on the markets overall once Jay Powell starts speaking. Jolts might, though. 10 o'clock, we get that, the uh, job opening and labor turnover. The Fed has hung its argument for tight labor markets on the fact that we have a lot of jolts numbers. But jolts is also going to today be adjusted for seasonal factors and population change. So like the January payrolls report, we may have some statistical anomalies there. Facebook this afternoon is something to keep an eye on, though. Does that support the Fed? or bring it back. Here's the problem for the Fed in one chart, basically. We had all of these numbers, the payrolls, the CPI, et cetera, going down, and it looked like the Fed was making progress. Then one month, it just jumps up in the, the month of January. So does that mean revert? That's what the Fed is waiting to find out. Markets don't seem to be wanting to wait for them to get the data. We are, as you guys were just talking about, pricing in now a 70% uh, chance, basically, of the Fed going 50 basis points on March 22nd. If uh, we get different numbers out of payrolls and CPI, I suspect those would change significantly. And here's the question I have, and John, I want to leave you with this chart. And uh, Victoria, you, you said you're waiting for the markets to catch up. Uh, Here's one for you. <laughs> Take a look at what has happened this month. The first line there, the red line, that was the jobs report. Then we get the CPI numbers, then we get the retail sales numbers, and then we get the day when uh, Loretta Mester and Jim Bullard said, yep. we are supporting 50 basis points, and finally the PCE, and it, uh, the, the yield curve just trades sideways. It doesn't widen at all, and then all of a sudden Jay Powell speaks, and it drops like a stone when he tells you what you should have already known from those previous events. So I'm not sure what the yield curve is actually telling us right now or whether Powell's going to move it much more today. Mike McKee, thank you, sir. Two's tens right now, negative 108, where we have seen a monster move 
is on the two-year piece. The two-year piece has moved about 100 basis points since the intraday lows of early February. And I think after the data we had for the month of January, looking back February, back to January, a lot of people asking the same question. And coming to a similar conclusion, is this economy much less rate sensitive than we thought it was? And what exactly is sufficiently restrictive at the central bank right now? This is what Matt Lazzetti of Deutsche Bank had to say. This line right here, the market should not be comfortable with the notion that a terminal rate near 550 is sufficient. And I think a lot of people are uncomfortable right now looking at the data we've seen so far. Oksana, I want to come to you on what this all means for the bond market. You came out up front, you sent me a message in early 2023 and you said this is meant to be the year of fixed income, the year of bonds, and I don't think it is. And Oksana, <laughs> over the last couple of weeks, based on what I've seen in the core fixed income part of the bond market, sovereign debt, the two-year piece, you're right. What's going on? So um, I think we're uh, seeing um, essentially, you know, you talked about the, the economy and whether what Powell is doing is sufficient to slow down the kind of economy we have today. And the kind of econ economy we have today is very different from the economy of the 70s or early, early 80s, right, which was very goods and manufacturing oriented or much more so than we are today. Today, you know, three, uh, two thirds of our economy is, is services and core services inflation continues to be strong. And that is what we were seeing coming into this year, along with a number of other um, indicators. But I think that's something we really can't lose sight of. The Fed has a direct knock-on effect on goods and manufacturing and housing. But how do you really have a direct um, knock-on effect on something like services, where you continue to see inflation, where you continue to see the most profound short, you know, shortages in terms of employees for the job openings that are there? And so I think that will be a, a, consistent, a consistent issue. And of course, we're also seeing some um, goods-related inflation rise its head again, for example, in used cars, et cetera. But um, that's not to say that there won't be opportunities in bonds this year. We absolutely think that there will be. We are now, as a marketplace, operating at a vol level that has been, for many years, standard for bonds, right? If you look, in, look at the MOVE index, which is kind of the VIX's cousin in bond land, um, where, it is ha where it has been for the past 12 to 16 months is where we used to live pre-great financial crisis. Prices. That was kind of the normal volatility level for bonds. So perhaps with central banks removing their meddling, we're going back there, and that means great opportunities. But it is all about the price. Technicals really matter, and they will also um, drive fundamentals once they become dramatic enough. And fundamentals will have to adjust, and I can't say this often enough, personal balance sheets, corporate balance sheets, government balance sheets, all of that has to adjust to the new reality of higher for longer and that is where the opportunities will come once the marketplace and once the economy really internalizes that. And we're not there yet. We're in the latter innings of the hiking cycle, but we're not yet in the later innings of that acclimation process. What I hear from you then is that high yield spreads have no business being at 390. Is that a fair assessment of your Absolutely view? Absolutely not. So what are Absolutely they doing not. down there? 390 yeah, 390 is below long-term average. Forget, you know, any recession average. And it has been, as I said, our view has been that the economy will be in the short term more resilient. And that's what we're continuing to see. Um, and so, yes, you know, balance sheets were generally strong coming into this. But no, high yield spreads have no business being down there. And as you see more and more of these kinds of deals that are short term, high coupon, right, just kind of a Hail Mary last, um, you know, last, uh, a ditch attempt to, to try and, and, and stave off a refinancing. When you see deals that come to market and promise to pay you in kind as opposed to pay you back in, um, in, in money, um, <laughs> these are all harbingers of wider rates, uh, wider spreads, excuse me, down the road. So um, yeah. stay tuned. There will be great opportunities in credit. Just not yet from your perspective, Victoria, from the equity not market yet. perspective as well. It's interesting to see the move yesterday in rates and then see the equity market Drop lower by 1.6%. Now, Lisa was saying earlier on the program on Bloomberg Surveillance that 1.6% in the grand scheme of things, given what happened in the bond market, not much. High yield spreads yesterday basically unchanged. What do you make of that resilience? Yeah, I think we have to look at the elements within the market, right? When we say that the market was down 1.6%, but what about the NASDAQ, right? The NASDAQ didn't get near as large of a hit 
as the rest of the market. We actually were trying to figure this out in our investment committee yesterday afternoon. What are the different parts of the market telling you? So maybe the fact that the NASDAQ was performing a little bit better yesterday is telling you that long end of the curve that we mentioned a little bit earlier, maybe that's saying, okay, some of the market is looking through the journey that the Fed is taking, and they're saying longer term, the Fed's going to do what they say. They're going to tap down inflation. That means longer duration assets actually performed a little bit better yesterday. That's some of those tech names. It's those NASDAQ names. I think you can see the same thing in the bond market. A lot of our clients are concerned and saying, do we need to just go all in six month or one um, one year bills in the market right now and capture that yield? Yes, I think you can do part of that, right, with part of your allocation. But I do think you need to look at some of the longer duration assets in the fixed income market as well. You've got a 10 year at 4%. Is it going to go tremendously higher from there? How much of the rate hikes are already baked in? Maybe we go up to or a little bit over where we were um, in the fourth quarter of last year. Maybe we get to a 430, 435, somewhere in there. But I don't think we go too much higher. Then you're going to have yields come down. So maybe capture a little bit further out the curve as well. So I think the market is um, it's very splintered right now. You've got some of those long duration assets performing a little bit better right now. You've got some of those more um, cyclical names taking a turn based on what they're seeing from the Fed. But you also have some of those staple names saying, look, the consumer is still pretty strong. We've got a strong labor market going. Maybe from a um, economic perspective for the economy, it's doing better. So I think you've got different parts of the market reacting differently. That's why you need a more balanced, diversified portfolio right now. Victoria sticking with us alongside Oksana. Let's get you some movers going into the opening bell about 14 minutes away. Here's Abby. Hey, John. Well, we do have two upside movers to take a look at, one of them being on an earnings uh, big beat. We have CrowdStrike, the cybersecurity firm. Those shares are up sharply, adding to an 18% year-to-date rally into today. They put up a big beat top and bottom. They saw acceleration across all key metrics, solid enterprise enterprise business. The professional services saw a 53% ramp, and they also put up uh, an outlook that uh, suggests 33% growth could be delivered, and some are saying that is conservative. So the stock is really uh, solidly higher. Occidental Petroleum, another stock that's higher. This, of course, as Berkshire Hathaway has added to their position, and they bought another 5.8 million shares recently for a total of 200 million shares, a 22.4% ownership there. John, they now, uh, this stock up more than 600% from the pandemic low, plus the dividend, not so bad at all. Abby, thank you. Coming up on this program, Chairman Powell facing the heat in D.C. Putting two million people out of work is just part of the cost, and they just have to bear it. Will, they, will, will working people be better off if, if we just walk away from our jobs and, and inflation remains well, five, six percent? Me... That conversation next. could speak directly to the two million who you're planning to get fired over the next year, what would you say to them? Inflation is extremely high and it's hurting the working people of this country badly. Putting two million people out of work is just part of the cost. Will working people be better off if, if we just walk away from our jobs? When you're slowing the economy, you're trying to put people out of work. We're trying to restore price stability. It doesn't do families any good if, if we stabilize housing prices while mortgage rates uh, continue to skyrocket. The same people who are having high mortgage um, uh, costs are also experiencing high costs for all the, all the basic necessities of life. Chair Powell, you are gambling with people's lives. A showdown between Senators and Fed Chair Powell taking shape on day one. Chair Powell heading back to the Hill for a second round of questioning in front of the House Financial Services Committee, finding himself in a bit of hot water as the central bank suggests higher unemployment is a price worth paying to get inflation back to target. Anne-Marie down in D.C. for more. Hey, AMH. 
Hey, John. Well, you could expect a lot of the same that we saw yesterday on the Senate side. Today on the House side, a grilling from lawmakers. And really, it was that tense exchange between Senator Elizabeth Warren and Jay Powell that really gets to the heart of the issue, which is that to tame inflation, you have to raise rates. And this could potentially mean job losses. She was using the Fed's own projections that we could see a 4.6% unemployment rate. And you saw uh, Fed Chair Jay Powell fight back and say, well, we sh what about the rest of the working people who we are trying to make sure we get inflation down? This goes to the heart of another issue, Jonathan, which is when you also have progressives like Senator Warren talking about the fact that this kind of inflation is hard for the Fed to bring down because it's things like global issues like supply chain kinks, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, and also what they also point to a lot, corporate greed. Anne-Marie, day two coming up. It starts in about 40 minutes' time. Anne-Marie, thanks for that. Final word now with Oksana Aronoff and Victoria Fernandez back with us. Got about 40 seconds each just for a final word on the bond market going into day two of testimony. Oksana, first to you. I think there is a tremendous amount of um, investing kind of pinned on this hope right now of rates coming down eventually at the longer end of the curve. And, you know, that you should buy and lock in at 4% on the 10-year. I mean, we had the same recommendation at 3.5% on the 10-year and at 2% on the 10-year last year. But if you think about what we've been through over the past 16 months or so, is that, you know, the hope at the start of last year was that the Fed wasn't going to go beyond 2%. The hope at the start of this year was that the Fed is kind of done. And we're learning over and over again that this Fed is resolute and they are continuing to essentially, you know, right the wrongs that, that they are somewhat responsible for. And I think that's what Powell is being pushed on um, in, in Congress right now, that, look, his, these measures are painful, but, and the Fed has to take some responsibility for the fact that they put them in place. But essentially, I don't think hope is a strategy. I think buying bonds at the longer end of the curve, when you are get, being paid, you know, percent more, essentially, at the very front end with very little to no risk, um, I don't know. I, I'm not on that trade. But uh, I do think there will be great opportunities um, this year as the bond markets continue to be volatile. Victoria? Yeah, look, I think if I'm pal, Jonathan, I'm pushing back a little bit on these people and saying, look, we're just trying to get the economy back to a stable place. The Congress is the one that kind of artificially created demand during COVID, and we understand why they did. And companies then had to go hire more workers in order to meet that demand. So they're trying to bring that back to a more normal economy. So Congress yeah. played a role in this, too, and they need to recognize that. And with that premise, the Fed is going to continue to hike rates in order to make that happen. That means the short end of the curve is going to continue to go higher. It's a good investment opportunity on the short end of the curve. We're going to see the inversion continue as those short ends go higher. But I think you will have some opportunity opportunity later this year. I do think we're going to get a recession later this year. You'll see some spreads widen out. Victoria Fernandez, thank you. And Oksana Aronoff as well. Coming up on this program, the morning calls and later. Markets focused on the host of upcoming data and Chairman Powell, day two. Equity futures just about unchanged. Let's get you some morning calls. First up, Wedbush raising its Apple price target to 190, reflecting positive demand trends for iPhones out of Asia. Argus upgrading Nordstrom to buy, expecting stronger results after reducing inventory and improving its supply chains. And finally, Berenberg downgrading Tesla to hold, seeing a limited upside after running more than 50% this year. Up next, inflation isn't going anywhere. That's the view from Bridgewater's Karen Carniel Tambor. That conversation is up next. Your opening bell just around the corner. Twenty-four seconds away from the open about this morning. Good morning to you. Equity futures totally unchanged on the S&P off the back of yesterday's sell-off. The Nasdaq going absolutely nowhere. Positive almost a tenth of one percent or so off the back of the carnage in the bond market over the last month or so. A 100 basis point move at the front end of the curve from the intraday lows on a two-year last month to where we are right now. Let's see opening bell switch at the board and get to the bond market. Yields look a little something like this. The 10-year yields are lower by four basis points. 391.68. On the two-year piece, 
of this curve, your two-year threw 5% in the last 24 hours. For the first time since 2007, we dropped just below that level. We come in a couple of basis points. Let's call it 4.99 on a two-year right now. Outside of that, in foreign exchange, euro dollar 105.53. Big day of gains for the US dollar yesterday. The strongest dollar move we've seen going back to November of last year. And just to round things out, crude right now, 76.50 on WTI. We're negative 1.3%. One stock to watch at the open, it's Campbell's topping earnings estimates and raising its full year forecast. The company saying this, we've successfully navigated the dynamic economic environment to mitigate inflation using targeted pricing and cost cutting initiatives as consumers absorbed higher prices. Abby has more. Hey, Abby. Hey, John. Yeah, it's really impressive uh, maneuvering that they have done out of the pandemic in terms of passing along those rising costs. A cost uh, a can of chicken soup Prior to the pandemic, less than a dollar, now well above a dollar, more than 30% inflation there, but consumers willing to pay it. So they put up this very strong quarter where they beat both top and bottom line estimates, uh, passing along those higher costs. They've also set themselves up to meet their updated sales growth guidance of sales growth of up 8% and a half percent to 10 percent soup sales up more than 12 percent it's interesting though their earnings have actually stayed about the same so this is a piece of that navigation that they're talking about but relative to sales their snacks were st strong on goldfish crackers and the pepper farm cookies uh, relative to again soup very strong growth there uh, and those higher prices and volumes compared to a year ago quarter that was really beset by supply constraints so over the last year you can see that Campbell's soup really outperforming the broader consumer staples uh, sector in a big, big way, uh, roughly 25% outperformance there. Not the same, though, for Brown Foreman, the parent of uh, Jack Daniels. They beat on sales, not so much for earnings, a 55% miss. So you could say that they're having a harder time with rising prices, uh, uh, but it also has to do with currency. That stock is down, not surprisingly, John. Abby, thanks for that. About two minutes into the session, then, the equity market's up by a couple of tenths of 1% on the S&P. On the Nasdaq, we're up by a third of 1%. Day two of testimony on Capitol Hill, this time in front of the House Financial Services Committee. That begins in about 27 minutes, 28 minutes time for Chairman Powell. The inflation debate continues. This is what Bridgewater's Karen Carniel Tambor has to say about it. Expecting inflation to stick around for a while. Here's the quote. The bottom line is this is not a 2% world. If we want to get back down to 2, that's not going to happen magically. It's going to take either much more economic weakness than we've already seen or significantly more tightening in order to bring it down. Karen, I'm really pleased to say, joins us right now. Karen, fantastic to catch up with you. Can we start there? Because this hope that we go back to the twos, 2% 2 growth, 2% 2 inflation, maybe 2% on the 10-year. Are you saying that hope's misplaced? Yes, I think it's definitely misplaced. I mean, we just... We came out of this long period where there was kind of a gravitational pull of inflation to two or even lower than two. And that's such a great thing if you're a central banker because it basically means you never have any tension. You can always ease as much as you'd like because there's nothing on the other side pressuring you not to. And I think we're just out of that world and Powell is just the first central banker in a long time to experience what it's like to actually have constraints where you have both inflation goals and growth goals to accomplish. And they're kind of at odds. Do you think there's a secular component to this that we're still underestimating? Absolutely. I mean, I think that one of the easiest ways to think about it is think about everything you heard a company spend on the previous 10 years. Almost every time a company spent a dollar from 1980 or so, they could pretty much tell you very reliably, I know that that dollar is going to reduce my cost structure. I'm, for example, moving my workers to a cheaper country. So even though I'm spending money, I know that's going to end up causing deflation at the end. Now, what do people need to spend on? Resilience. What does that mean to have another supply chain? Having an extra supply chain means you're spending twice. You're not going to reduce cost through that. You have to spend more to be able to be resilient to all sorts of geopolitical problems. What does decarbonization lead to? I mean, it's very helpful in the long term to avoid climate change, but in the near term, that spending is not going to lower your cost base. So we're seeing a lot of spending that needs to happen for defense, resilience, climate change reasons. And then in addition to that, the big wave of secular um, disinflation, like things like globalization, is basically so behind us in the sense that everything we buy, our iPhones, our this or that, any good, it's already globalized. Going through another cycle like that is what would be needed in order to have disinflation come out the other end. So those are big secular pressures that are going to be with us for 10 years, 20 years, and it's a big reversal from what we've experienced till now. Well, this is a multi-decade call, and that raises the obvious question on day two of Powell's testimony. Is the Fed chair trying to tackle secular issues with the blunt toll of interest rates? 
I don't think Powell has any choice. I mean, he's coming out of an environment where, for the first time since more or less coming out of World War II, you had uh, monetary policy and fiscal policy stimulating at the same time. And we saw it's extremely effective because you print money and literally send people checks so they can go spend those checks. Very effective way to get inflation going, and that's what's happening now. And he can't control what the lawmakers and Congress do. That stimulus has already been out there. Everyone got their checks. It's not like there's a lot of that being pulled back proactively. And he's got a very, very, very strong economy. We've seen the jobs, jobs numbers. We're seeing the income numbers. We're seeing the wages numbers. And he can't allow on his watch for inflation to get out of control. Given the framework you have, though, Karen, how far do you think they're going to have to go to control inflation? Look, there's no saying exactly how much more they'll have to raise rates because we're in a world where every time they raise rates, it takes time for that to fully flow through the economy. And we just don't know how much of the prior rate rises are still ahead of us. But it sure looks like the economy is resilient and they're going to have to raise certainly more than is priced in. If you look at the market uh, pricing, it's actually suggesting that they're going to be able to cut pretty soon. And that seems completely implausible to me. And that's what's still in the markets. Are you closer to six then on the peak rate, on the terminal rate in this hiking cycle? Closer, but what's great as an investor is you don't even have to be able to call that because you know that when you're buying, what's priced in is even declines, let alone getting anything like that. So tell me how big you think the disconnect is right now between this bond market and risk elsewhere. Equities, which are still looking pretty resilient, high yield spreads, which are still south of 400. How big is that disconnect? I think that the stock market hasn't internalized yet that there's going to have to be uh, an earnings recession that has to come. And if you look at it, right now, earnings are already down somewhat at sort of the S&P level, even though the economy has been extremely resilient, which is rare. Usually you don't get that. So earnings could fall a lot more if you actually get the economy slowing. And eventually the economy will have to slow to get the inflation under control. And so what's basically happened in the stock market is more or less just processing higher rates. Higher rates means that you, know, you have a higher discount rate of all those cash flows into the future, but not really processing that a recession needs to be coming at some point. So in the meantime, you've got equities challenged against the backdrop as, as you say, tough earnings. You've got bonds challenged against, as you say, the issue of inflation, which raises the question, Karen, where on earth do I go for uncorrelated diversification? Because equities and bonds are still rising and falling together. I don't see how that breaks anytime soon based on these developments. Where do you go? That's right. I think it's one of the toughest environments to invest in risky assets um, that we've seen certainly in our lifetimes and probably you know more than our, our investing lifetimes um, because the job of the Fed, as we've been talking about, is to make cash attractive, is to raise the cash rate and make that attractive and slow the economy that way. And that means that increasingly investors are going to be looking and saying, wait a minute, am I getting enough compensation for sitting in a risky stock, for sitting in a long-term bond versus what I can get basically risk-free having my money in cash, that pull towards cash is part of what's going to help slow the economy and get inflation further under control. And I think the best diversification that investors can find right now in the markets is, first of all, moving more of their fixed income towards inflation-linked fixed income, where they're actually get paid the inflation as it occurs. That's a possibility most investors haven't really, you know, kind of utilized sufficiently. And number two, looking around the world, not the whole world looks like this. So look at places where you don't have an inflation problem like Japan. You don't have a persistent inflation problem there. They're still going to be really excited to see 2% inflation happen, let alone more than that. When they are screening for uncorrelated returns, they often find themselves in China. Karen, the risks around that story right now, and as you said it in your notes recently, you said this, you said we could face a multi-decade route of spending to extricate ourselves from China. I get that 18 months ago it was uninvestable. Now all of a sudden people are piling in, given the reopening. What are the risks around that story? I think that Chinese assets still do provide very significant diversification relative to almost any asset you can buy. China is just such a large economic entity that very much goes according to its own drum, if you will, right? They have their own monetary policy, their own fiscal policy, and you see that when they're reopening, that's out of step with the rest of the world. So you're getting true diversification. I think the pricing of the equities is still pretty attractive. If you just look at how much do earnings have to really grow and outperform to do well there. They don't have to grow that much relative to what's priced into the U.S. Very attractive. The bonds are very different, very attractive assets. And so to me, this is definitely a diversification play that investors should be looking at very seriously. And from a secular perspective, it's very clear that there are big opportunities there. That said, I think investors have to consider their risk tolerance and how they look at what will happen geopolitically 
what their tolerance is to that. And we don't know where regulation will be going. We don't know what it'll be like to have assets there. And we know that there'll be more screening, more questions. And so it really depends on different investors, their circumstances, and their ability to utilize that diversification given their circumstances. It's clear from what you're saying, though, suggesting is that we could be facing a leadership change within equity markets, a leadership change between geographies, that maybe that leadership comes from abroad. And it raises the specter of something I know you've addressed already, but I'd love for you to elaborate on just how vulnerable the US dollar might be against the changes of those flows, those cross currents. Well, I think you get these 10 years, sometimes longer moves where investors pile into one thing and then you have a vulnerability build up that once it shifts can go pretty far. And right now, the biggest thing that's happened in the last you know, 10, 20 years in the stock markets is that US tech companies kind of ate the world, right? They were the highest performers. They took over every industry. And if you look anywhere around the world, most of what people hold is US stocks. US stocks are a huge part of the global market cap. That's where everyone is comfortable investing. And that basically means that it can't go much further than that. They can't go and again, double their allocation to the US. It can really only stabilize here or reverse, and there'll be interest in other areas. And so many other, other areas have been sort of ignored. You have almost no investors talking about other stock markets around the world because they're so heavily in the US and in tech. And that is just one thing that adds to the vulnerability of a dollar of, as that shifts, as you get pricing to be extreme. And the same thing, you know, Fed, most extreme to tighten, strongest economy. As that shifts, you just have a possibility for the dollar. Just, it's just positioned at such an extreme. The U.S. needs to be getting inflows, needs to all, have that all continuing, that when it topples, that has room to run. So let's make a big bet. And I know maybe right now is not the moment to make big bets, but let's take a multi-decade trade if we can. What would that be for you? I mean, three decades ago, get along the bond market, three decade long bond bull market, and you're thinking we upend that. What's the bet right now? Well, let me say one thing I think is a fun fact, which is if I told you with certainty through history what will happen in 20 or 30 years, it's actually very hard to make money as an investor that way. The fluctuations <laughs> along the way, disaster. So it's pretty amazing. You test that. You say, I tell you with perfect certainty, 1980, what happens in 2000? Yeah. Not that helpful. So I'll just say what I'm about to say, probably not that helpful because the time frame is so long. But I think the most clear multi-decade bet in my mind is that inflation is going to matter. And so investors are not going to be able to look at assets and sort of forget their inflation characteristics. And until now, you've just had a multi-decade period where you can ignore inflation and not think about the inflation characteristics of assets at all. The best example of that is that stocks and bonds were highly diversifying because inflation just wasn't a factor. So every time growth fell, you could ease. That's it. High diversification. And I think that world is gone. It's going away. And that means that uh, it's not a where assets will move, but what their relationships will be to each other. That has to change with the move we have in inflation. I won't hold you to that. And Karen, I agree with you. I think a lot of people watching, there's nothing more frustrating than getting the macro call right and then the market call wrong. I did want to finish on this, though. It's International Women's Day. We always go out of our way to showcase the best talent on Wall Street when this day comes about. This could be a world-class lineup any day of the week. I said that already this morning. Karen, when I speak to professional women on Wall Street, though, I think they get frustrated by having a special day by having quotas. Some of them actually find it quite offensive and just want to be treated as any other person with a fantastic resume, great qualities to contribute to a big business. Karen, in your experience, what do we need to do better on that front? Yeah, I, I love having International Women's Day, personally. I think that um, it was meaningful to me when I was growing up in the business to look up and see women doing different things. And it's meaningful to me today as a mother um, to, to, to do this role as a mother of two and have women who are not yet mothers think through what it would be like to become a mother and that you can do this role as a mother because it was something I was certainly nervous about before having children. What would that be like? I think the mother's role is special and unique and the fact that there haven't been as many women on Wall Street through time means that our role is important and it is important to showcase that and realize that there are women in all these uh, positions in Wall Street um, and in the investment industry that do this and it doesn't like you're saying in some point it will not matter what uh, gender you are but at this point I still think there are people looking to us to know that it's possible. Well Karen I can say you're a kick-ass mom and a whole lot more. Thanks for being with us today. We appreciate it. Karen Karanov there, Taran Bohr on the latest from Bridgewater. Karen Karanov, Tam Bohr, just absolutely fantastic. Up next on this program, the bill to ban TikTok getting banned its bid. We're working with Congress uh, to address concerns posed by apps like TikTok. This is not about a political concern. This is about making sure um, uh, that we do the right thing for the American people. That conversation up next.
This is Bloomberg Z Open. I'm Lisa Mateo, live in the principal room. Coming up, Citigroup CFO Mark Mason. That conversation at 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 9.30 p.m. in London. This is Bloomberg. Everybody's talking about TikTok. There are a lot of us that are concerned about uh, privacy. The risks of insecure information and communication technology. We need Congress to move beyond the whack-a-mole solution that, that we have been focused on. Our tools to date have been relatively limited. We have to make sure that we have the resources in place and the authorities in place to establish a holistic and methodical approach, a more strategic approach, a more comprehensive approach. I do think we're going to pass this. The White House endorsing a bipartisan bill giving the president authority to ban or force the sale of TikTok. The National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan saying the following. We look forward to continue working with both Democrats and Republicans on this bill and urge Congress to act quickly to send it to the president's desk. TikTok pushing back, a spokesperson saying the following. The swiftest way to address any national security concerns is for the Committee on Foreign Investment in the U.S. to adopt the proposed agreement that we worked with them for nearly two years on. Anne-Marie joins us now down in Washington. Hey, Anne-Marie. Hey, John, it's not a TikTok bill in name. It's called the Restrict Act, but certainly it's going after an app like TikTok. And what this bill is trying to do is give the Commerce Department a lot more tools, actually an extension of what we saw under the Trump administration in executive order, to go through a process to see what kind of foreign technology potentially could be a national security risk. And Secretary Raimondo actually said she thinks it's bad policy to go after a specific company, but there should be a process. And this bipartisan bill, you have a number of individuals from both sides of the aisle signing up for it. But key is that it does look like it's one of those TikTok bills that the White House is also willing to sign off on. AMH, down in Washington, we will see. Terry Haynes of Pangea says he reckons they're going to do it. The recent push to ban TikTok paying dividends for a number of U.S. listed stocks, as you can imagine, shares a snap lower this morning. But this coming after three days of gains, jumping more than 10% since Friday. CFRA weighing in on the possible market implications, saying the following. A potential ban would likely improve engagement for U.S. social media outlets and drive greater ad dollars to those platforms. He goes on to say, we believe the biggest beneficiaries of a TikTok ban would be Snap, Meta and Google's YouTube business in that order. Ed has more. Hey, Ed. Yeah, good morning, Jonathan. You're right. Snap down more than four and a half percent. Biggest drop in more than two weeks, snapping three straight days of gains. And it was only two days ago that we closed on Snap above the 200 day moving average for the first time since October 2021. The logic's really simple. If the United States were to ban TikTok, there are one million eyeballs that would go elsewhere. And as you said, a number of sell side names point to the read through benefit and potential upside for names like Meta that have focused on ephemeral video and short form video, but also YouTube and Snap, crucially, because of the, the similarities between the two platforms. This is a really interesting one for the ARBs, because actually, if you look at the reaction this morning, having had a night to digest the contents of this proposed bill, even though there's White House support, TD Cowan, for example, points out there's no presumptive requirement to divest TikTok. That is different to previous legislative attempts in this area. Many of the previous uh, uh, drafted legislations have asked for some sort of divestiture. Um, that's not the case here. And so actually, there is a sense, a growing sense, including from Bloomberg Intelligence, that the likelihood of an outright ban in this country is unlikely. Ed, thanks for that. This conversation is going to continue. They have the tools potentially to deal with it further down the road. Whether they choose to execute is a, another question entirely. Here's the market for you. About 22 minutes in. Let's get you some sector price action. Here's Abby. Well, John, it's interesting because we have the S&P 500 barely doing anything up uh, very, very slightly on anemic volume once again. Relative to the sector action, we have energy in the top spot up about seven tenths of one percent. Even as oil declines, that of course has to do with Occidental and Berkshire Hathaway taking a larger stake in that company. Real estate, tech materials are also among the up sectors. Consumer Discretionary is the downside sector, down about seven tenths of one percent. And then we also, if we take a look at what's happening over the last week or so, we will see that interestingly, and uh, one of your guests earlier, I think Oksana or Victoria Fernandez actually was making the point that despite the fact that we have uh, yields uh, kind of over the last couple of days higher over the last week, that 10 year yield coming in, not matching the two year yield, that's actually surprisingly giving tech a boost. That tech index over the last week, John, up three percent. I would not have expected that. At all. It's hard to get your head around that, isn't it, Abby? And that's the difficult part of all of this. Karen was speaking just 20 minutes ago. 
and she was talking about how difficult it is to get the macro call right and then the, the market call right at the same time. Well, I can tell you, year to day, if you'd guess what two-year yields would have done, would you have guessed where the equity market has been? Probably not. This morning, at least, we're down another couple of basis points on a two-year, just south of 5% after climbing through that level for the first time since 2007 in yesterday's session off the back of day one of Chair Powell testimony. Day two, just around a corner, your 10-year comes in five basis points, 3.92, a couple of days away from a payrolls report. Up next, your trading diary. Five minutes into the session, call it 26. Equities just about unchanged going into day two of testimony on Capitol Hill from Chairman Powell. That's the price action. Let's get to that trading diary. Top of the hour, Fed Chair Jay Powell kicking off that second day of congressional testimony. Full coverage, of course, here on Bloomberg. Plus, we get the monthly jobs report ahead of the Fed's beige book. That's the jolts report, the monthly jolts report just around the corner. President Biden releasing his budget proposal tomorrow. Look out for that. Governor Corona's last BOJ rate decision coming up on Friday. And finally, the main event, payrolls to close out the week. Looking forward to that. From New York, thank you for choosing Bloomberg TV. Good luck for the rest of the trading day. This was the countdown to the open. This is Bloomberg.